before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child Well, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture out of the Gospel of Mark this morning, if you want to flip there. Uh, Mark chapter 12 is where we're going to be at this morning. I've had a lot of thoughts going through my mind as to where we're going to go 
uh, this week with this. And kingdom first is the, it's what I settled on. Not settled on, but this is really where I feel like God is leading us. This is where God is, is taking us in America. These are the words that have kind of just really been sitting with me pretty heavily. Kingdom first, because social media is just an awful thing lately. And um, I'm seeing more and more Christians posting their political views rather than their faith views. I think y'all have probably thought about that as well. It's probably not just me that's, that's thinking about that. But we're living in political chaos. I was at a, a seminar at the beginning of this last week, and the speaker said, we're not living in the darkest of times, they're just the most public. They're the most public. Everything that's happening is on the internet, it's on TV. Every politician now has a platform to speak their mind, and not just politicians, but Everybody has somewhere to speak their mind now. It's not the darkest of times, it's the most public. Because everything has become public, Christians have begun to put their political filter in front of their faith filter. Everything comes out more political than it does more faithful to God. Well, that's what I'm noticing at least. Red and blue have become very prominent colors in America. Not just because of the flag, but because of political beliefs. You know, they, if you don't choose a side, it's almost like you're more hated now than you were if you just kept your mouth shut before. But rather than choosing a side, I say we choose the purple color of royalty of Jesus Christ in America again. We put the kingdom of God ahead of everything else. Our faith filter comes before our political filter, or any other filter for that matter. That's what the early church did. They weren't worried about what the Roman Empire was doing. They were worried about the kingdom of God first in their lives. We have a lot of scripture that talks to us about that. Acts is a great example of what Pastor Jim's been preaching about, what the early church did after the resurrection after Pentecost, after pandemic. And so you see, Jesus didn't come to fit into one party or another. Jesus came to take over completely. Jesus came to change life on earth. Not for it to stay the same or for us to follow the ways of the world. Jesus came to shake things up a bit, to change things, to disturb the Roman Empire, Jesus came teaching different ethics, different morals. Jesus came teaching in love. He was doing something different than everybody else was. The Pharisees, the scribes, as we're getting ready to read about, they were worried about the law, the old covenant. Jesus was here to proclaim a new covenant. The early church Christians were so loyal to the royal that they would not align with the Roman Empire at all. They weren't going to worship the gods that the Roman Empire wanted them to worship. They were going to put the kingdom first. That's what was important to them. So how did one small group of people, it was small compared to everybody else in the Roman Empire, it was a small group of people that created kind of a chaos, turmoil, confusion, a distraction to what was happening in the empire. How did they cause all of this to happen? It's because they chose to put the kingdom first. The empire brought it upon themselves of this chaos and the, they, they didn't know what the Christian group was all about. They didn't really understand what was going on with these people and so the empire wasn't really happy about it. It was just Christians choosing to, cho to choosing to worship a different God, right? That's what it was all about. They were choosing to worship the one and only God. 
Andy Stanley said, early Christians moved the moral, ethic, the moral and ethical needle of the empire by cultural disruptive unity. It was a new kind of unity. They were unified by the ethics and morals that Jesus was teaching. They, were, they weren't going to commit adultery and steal and treat their wives wrong. And they were, they were going to live life differently. They were going to look different than everybody else. And the empire didn't know how to feel about that. And so, yes, the empire did strike back. They didn't like it. They didn't like what the Christians were doing. So they tried to put an end to it. But the word of God is still standing thousands of years later. Praise the Lord. The Christians weren't, they weren't offering sacrifices to the gods of Rome. They were worshiping a risen Savior. And so because of that, they really truly saw that the ethics and the morals, the teachings, what Jesus predicted was going to happen, happened. And so they said, you know what? I'm going to follow the guy that said, I'm going to die, but in three days, I'm going to be raised to life again. And so they chose to follow that teacher rather than any other teacher that had come before him. The early church, they were just different. They chose to put the kingdom first. So let's, let's look at some scripture this morning. Uh, Mark chapter 12 is where we're at this morning, uh, starting in verse 28. It says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher. The man replied, you're right in saying that God is one and there's no other God but him. As if Jesus needed to be told that he was right. You know. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. You see, right before this, right before uh, the greatest commandment was given, the Pharisees and the scribes were still trying to trap Jesus. They were still asking questions, trying to throw him off. They, they were trying to get him to say something that they could convict him of a crime for. They, they didn't want Jesus teaching the way he had been teaching. They didn't want him loving people the way he had been loving. They didn't want him to continue healing people. They wanted Jesus to hit a brick wall, be done with him, so that they could move on and continue teaching the old law, the law and the prophets. But what really gets me is that Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. He may be close, really close, but his understanding, he, he hadn't moved from understanding what Jesus was teaching in his mind to moving it to his heart. See, the scribe is most likely trying to get Jesus to sum up the entire Torah, 613 laws into one. That's what, that's what this scribe wanted. And it, it seems that this guy, he's not saying that he's wanting to trap Jesus, but it almost seems like he comes to Jesus humbly. He, he just wants to know. As many other people have asked Jesus, they just want to know, what does it take to get into the kingdom of God? What, what do I have to do? He says, you're close. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. He says, you're close. But for some reason, he says, you, you don't have it. You're not quite there. He understands what Jesus is saying. He clearly agrees with what Jesus is saying, but he hasn't 
apparently made up his mind that he's going to love God and love his neighbor. Jesus recites the Shema. It's recited three times to keep God at the forefront of their lives. That's what the Jewish people did. They said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They worshipped God. They kept the kingdom of God in the forefront of their lives. They kept it right there in front of them so that no matter what was going on throughout their day, God was right in the middle of what they were doing. By loving God first, we're learning to love like Jesus. That's what Jesus was saying. This is the love that Jesus has. It's, he loves God first and he loves his neighbor. Everything about Jesus loved God. Not just because he was God, but because he loved God. He was the son of God. Jesus uses the old covenant to declare this new covenant. Within these two simple commands. Two Short sentences, and Jesus just summed up 613 laws that they had failed to carry out. Jesus just summed it up in one phrase. Right? Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus took us from obeying laws to loving God personally. That's what Jesus does. He sums things up for us. He he makes it easy for us to understand, but it's up to us if, to decide whether we're going to let God into our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. So let's look at that phrasing for just a second. The first point that I want to point out to you this morning is this. Undivided love and loyalty. The early church had undivided love and loyalty. They They weren't going to love Rome and love God. They were just going to focus on the kingdom first. How many times can I say that this morning? Hopefully a lot more. The Jewish people would understand the heart as the center of the person. It's the center of their thought and their feelings. Pretty much everything that they did flowed from their heart. And so that's what Jesus is, is telling us. When it comes to loving with the heart, there's really no holding back. When we love God, there's no holding anything back. It's loving God. It's being totally sold out to God. That's what Jesus is saying. But he says it in a couple of different ways. But when we love with our heart, we're loving authentically. I asked a friend, I said, um, now you may not agree with this, but I said, what do younger people, what do people in their 30s, 20s, younger teens. What do they want? He said, I think they want authentic love. They want the church to be authentic. That's what this makes me think about. Jesus wanted us to pour out this authentic love to every single person that walks in the church. But first, he wants us to pour it out to God, to be authentic, to be completely putting God first in our lives. The heart is the place of conscious and decisive spiritual activity. A Christian's love should be authentic. And it should flow from the heart. The Jewish people would know that the soul was also what gives the body life and breath. The soul. Jesus says, so your heart. No, he says your soul. And in the Greek, this would be the psyche. It's what makes you, you. Everything about you, everything that you do, are you outgoing, are you uh, sociable, extroverted? And he says, okay, if that's what you are, then love God in any way that your personality works best. Whether it be to stand in front of people or to share with somebody personally. Is it to go and serve in a big public setting or is it to serve behind the scenes? Jesus is saying, everything about you, God's created you exactly the way he wanted you to be. Now for me, it took some time for God to really show me who he wanted me to be. It takes time. It takes relationship. It takes love between you and God to truly find what he wants you to do. But it's spending time with God that shows you who you are. So, it doesn't matter 
If you're quiet, sociable, introverted, extroverted, God has put in you something to do for the kingdom. And Jesus adds, to also love the Lord your God with your mind. Mind was added so that the, so that the Greek readers would also be included so that they would understand the very thought process that Jesus was talking about. That the mind is supposed to love God. So not just the heart and the soul, but the mind. The mind is easily corrupted, right? So is the heart. I mean, we get blown back and forth so frequently about, well, you should believe this or you should believe that. Well, this passage of Scripture aligns with this belief. Well, this passage of Scripture aligns over here. No. Read it for yourself. Know what God's Word says. Know it. It's the mind that we should allow God to master. We also need God, obviously, in our heart, our soul, but to know God. We have to, we have to know God and let that move into our lives. Jesus is saying, every ounce of your being, let God in. The mind is, a, is, is kind of a funny thing. I, so, Jacob is, we couldn't have asked for a better son. We couldn't have prayed for much better than God has given us. We're, we just love him. But I realized that kids are just kind of programmed to be selfish. You know what I mean? He can't help it at this point, right? <laughs> They're just, we're, we're kind of all programmed to be selfish. The mind is just, it, it just, that's just what it is. We, we don't, you know, we kind of have, we have to learn to share with other kids when we're young. Jacob's kind of at that point where, like, he gets the concept of like, oh yeah, you can play with me, but don't touch anything I've touched already, because those are, those are my toys, not yours. You know, and uh, I have a niece and nephew that live near us here, and, and uh, they all play great together, but they all have their own things where they're selfish about. It's like, yeah, I don't care about that, you can play with that, but don't, don't touch my spray bottle that I want to spray you with, or... Uh, don't sit in my chair. We see that one a lot. You know, it, it just, it's exactly that way. We're, we're just all selfish. That's the way the world has kind of created us to be. The world creates us to think about me first. You know, everything out there tells us that I need to be the one. It's all about me. I think there's a country song about that. Probably. But it just, it's putting the kingdom of God first, ahead of our own selfishness. And if we're going to do that, we have to let God master our mind. The mind of God in us. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. So not just with your heart and soul, as if that's not enough. Let your mind be uh, completely sold out, given to God. But then he also says physically, your strength, all of your strength. Let every ounce of who you are. And it's not just your physical strength. It's not about how much you can lift and how fast you can run or anything like that. It's about your physical talents, your beauty, your wealth, position, your reputation, all of these things fall into the category of living completely for God, loving God completely. So it's these four areas of our lives we truly are led to placing God first and at the center of our lives. So the second point this morning is God at the center. So I was talking with... Um, Pastor John, Dr. Dr. Williamson, if uh, y'all know him, he usually has quite a few things to say, and he loves to get to share with me, and I love getting to talk with him as well. One day our conversation, I don't even know how we ended up here, but our conversation had moved to this idea of a circle, and our lives in the circle. And we were talking about how if we're going to love God completely, 
We can't stand outside of this circle where God's in the middle. You know, that's kind of life before Christ. We, we're kind of outside of this circle of, of, of God. But when we come to know God, we take a step in. We're in the circle. We know Christ. We've accepted Christ. He's in our life. But we haven't really, maybe haven't learned everything yet about God. Our relationship hasn't, hasn't gone deeper with Christ. We know Christ. We're in the circle, but we're more at the edge than we are at the middle. And I think some people try to live as close to the edge as they can so that they still get the world out here, but God's still there. God's still there. He's still, he's in the circle. I know, I know God. I'm good with God. We're, you know, we're, we, we talk every now and then. John and I were talking about it's, it's facing this way with God at our back at the circle to turning around and moving completely to the middle with God. You know, that's, that's where this, this love of God totally sold out. Loving God with everything about us really makes sense. No longer are we living to try and get outside of the circle and, and bring things in with me. It's turning are back to those things and lo loving God. Loving God completely. If we get the center of the circle right, the, the circumference will come right. Everything about the circle will be about God. No longer is it about facing out and trying to hold on to the world. None of that matters because God's got us. He's at the center. He's taking care of us. The scribe's kind of funny in, the, uh, in, in verse 32. He says, well, well said, teacher. The man replied, you're right in saying that God is one and there's no other before him, other but him. To love him with all your heart and all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. He, he tells Jesus he's right. It's like, well, duh, of course Jesus is right. He's right about everything. He knew that you were going to ask that question before you asked him that question. But he says, you're so close. You're so close. The kingdom of God is not far from you. But you're still choosing to not dive in completely to what God wants for you. Wouldn't we rather hear that you're right in the center of the kingdom of God than, well, you're not far, you're right. You know what it says, you know what the command is, but you're, you're close, but you're not quite there. I don't want to hear that from God. I want to hear, yep, you move the kingdom of God first. I, everything I do is about God. Everything about me loves God, and because of that, because God is at the center of my life, that love just flows to everybody around me, everybody around us. In order for God to be at the center, we must move our stuff out of the circle, and let God completely envelop and completely take over our lives. You know, Jesus isn't really one for uh, self-love, like I was talking about. The circle has no room for selfishness. The circle has no room for what we want. It's all about God. Because when it's all about God, everything comes into place. God takes care of everything within the circle. You know, I, I've talked to people about this of... of um, Trying to take care of ourselves. You know, I hear a lot now, well, I have to take care of myself. I'm, uh, man, this week just drained me. I, I just really need some time alone from everybody so that I can just watch Netflix and, and chill um, just by myself and not have, um, you know, people around. Or maybe I, I just need to go out and party. Just recharge. Just, I just need time for me. Got to... God doesn't really um, like the selfish mindset very much. It's not what God's about. 
this idea of selfishness, I was reading this week, and, and somebody pointed out that selfishness is kind of like a fire. And it, uh, it made me think about when you, when you light a fire, you, you get it going with one small flame. And in order for it to take, if you blow on it, it ignites faster, right? The fire can, it'll just consume everything, all the wood, everything in there. And I was reading this week and somebody pointed out and, and they said that you blow on the fire to add to the fire, but God will never think of blowing on the fire of self-love. God doesn't blow on the fire of selfishness. God blows on the fire of the Holy Spirit. God lets the Holy Spirit engulf us, but not self-love, not selfishness. It's all about God, God first. That's what's important for us to understand. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not, uh, it's not thinking less of ourselves in this. It's just thinking about ourselves less. It's thinking about others more because when we're serving other people, we're, we're fulfilling what God wants for us. God wants to be the all-consuming fire of our life. We live in the middle, but God gives life and love. God's the one that recharges us. He fills our cup so that we can pour it out to other people, to love other people. Finally, loving your neighbor is love in action. Mark writes here, it's, it's more about uh, agape love. It's an action love. It's, it's going and doing something about the love of God in us. That's what it's all about. It's going and doing rather than just keeping it all to ourselves. God wants us to share this love with somebody else. And in Luke, when Jesus talks about the the greatest commandment, it's paired with the Good Samaritan. You remember that story? A man is brutally beaten, robbed, left on the side of the road to die. A priest walks by and he lets him just, you know, he moves to the other side of the road and keeps walking. A Levite, the same thing. But then finally a Good Samaritan comes by. And at that moment, instantly, the man that had been beaten lying on the side of the road became the Good Samaritan's neighbor. It doesn't matter where we're at. Somebody around us can be our neighbor that we can show the love of God to. Until we figure out that we have to love God and love our neighbor, we're just, we're just not going to get very far. It's about the kingdom of God first. In Romans 13, verse 8, it says, Let no debt remain outstanding. Remember, the Good Samaritan didn't want to be paid back for taking care of the guy on the side of the road. He just wanted to make sure he was okay. It says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Our only debt is to love one another. To the end of our lives, we are to love one another. I think Dave Ramsey might be okay with that kind of debt, right? He doesn't really like debt very much, but I think the debt of love, I think that's a good one. To love one another. And so, one question for you. Through all of this, I, I've talked about love the Lord your God with everything about you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so I ask, what does love require of you? What does love require you to do for your neighbor? What does God's love in you require you to do for somebody else? Maybe it's something small like uh, helping, I don't know, helping your neighbor mow their yard if, they're, if they can't, right? Right? Maybe it's something bigger than that. Maybe you go down and you serve homeless people a meal. There's all kinds of different ways to serve. Love requires us to move our stuff out of the middle of the circle and ask God to move in. Love requires us to put the kingdom of God first. 
Mark wraps up this portion of scripture by sharing with us that Jesus sees that this scribe is not far from God. However, knowing these commands and actually obeying them are totally different. You're so close. You're so close. Jesus would be irresistible to this world. Irresistible. People could not look at Jesus and not fall in love with him. Jesus would be irresistible because when you come to know what Jesus stands for, not what Christians stand for, not our political views, but what Jesus Christ stands for, the teachings that he has given us, if people knew that, he would simply be irresistible. If our faith filter came before everything else, Jesus would be irresistible to everybody else. Churches would be packed. People would be coming and kneeling before God. Jesus is irresistible. But when we choose ourselves first, Jesus becomes resistible. People see, um, I don't like these self-righteous people. I don't like seeing people that think they're better than me because they know Jesus. It's not what it's about. It's about knowing God, loving God, and loving our neighbor. Jesus becomes irresistible when we listen to these two commands, loving God and loving your neighbor. If you put God first, you will love your neighbor as yourself, right? Imagine what we could do for the kingdom of God here and now, if every single Christian put the kingdom of God first, as the early church did, they worshipped God above the empire. They didn't care what other people were going to think because Jesus was simply irresistible because of his love for each and every one of us. Marriages would not end in divorce, but husbands loving their wives and wives their husbands as Christ loves the church. Teens wouldn't view purity as an option anymore. Children would learn how much Jesus loves them and that would continue on the rest of their lives. Financial issues would be resolved and the world would be a less self-centered place if we remember to put the kingdom of God first. So I leave this question with you today. What does love require of you? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with these words that you taught. Remembering the early church that this is exactly what they did. They loved God. The kingdom of God came first. And so I pray in the upcoming days that we would put our faith filter first. That the kingdom of God would come first. So Father, be with us. I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us. Come as an all-consuming fire. Father, we love you. And I pray that we wouldn't just be close to the kingdom of God. But that we would know you personally that we would love you with every ounce of our being and that we would go from this place loving our neighbor as well. So Father, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Your grace.